We now come to the final session of the day, which is a keynote panel on the subject of serving and acting on weak signals, a leadership challenge. And I'd like to apologize for standing here because I'm standing in place of Riz Khan, who is uh, a great communicator and very funny, but unfortunately he was held up in Dubai, will arrive tomorrow, but can't be here to chair this session this evening. The session of serving and acting on weak signals, a leadership challenge, really comes out of the work of Professor George Day on my uh, right, extreme right here, who is a professor uh, at the Wharton School. Uh, he did a doctorate in um, Columbia and has written 16 books. One of the books is entitled Peripheral Vision, Detecting the Weak Signals That Can Make or Break Your Company. And he's going to expand on that with a maximum time limit of 15 minutes, if that's all right, Professor Day. And then it's a great pleasure on my immediate right uh, to have Dr. Andreas Jacobs, who is chairman of the board of Barry Kalabout, I hope that's the right pronunciation, as well as chairman of the board of ADECO, who has been a great entrepreneur, and I have very happy memories of him taking part in a panel two years ago on the challenges of family business. So, Professor Day, it's over to you. Do give him a big welcome. I need a remote, since I have some slides. Could someone find me a remote? Here we go. There's a remote there. Aha. Very good. It is truly a privilege to, uh, to be here and address this audience. Uh, and I, I'm particularly impressed with what I've learned today, what I've seen today, and what I've heard today. The, uh, I, I want to commend the uh, ISC for a marvelous job and for the foundation. Um, although I must say that I'm still confused. We have looked at risk in many, many dimensions, but my confusion is now at a much higher level. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, what I talk about may uh, allay a little bit of that confusion. It is a difficult subject of necessity, uh, because we're looking into uh, a, a lot of uncertainty, and we're trying to track weak signals that uh, are the precursors of threats and opportunities. But these weak signals come from the periphery, so I'm going to invite you now to think about the periphery in the same sense as we have peripheral vision. That is, the fuzzy zone on the edge of your vision because that's where the threats and opportunities are first seen. Uh, however, the nature of weak signals is that they're also shrouded in noise, and the signal-to-noise ratio is really very poor. So it's crucial to be able to extract the few weak signals that we really need to pay attention to. Uh, and I, th I think you're all very familiar with that issue. What I want to focus on is what I call the leadership challenge. And this came about uh, as we explored uh, eventually well over 130 companies, many we lived with for days at a time, and we were interested in the question, why are some companies much better at sensing and acting on weak signals? Why were some leadership teams much better at seeing sooner? And it's that journey that I'm just going to briefly summarize uh, because uh, when we went into it, it wasn't clear exactly what factors made the difference. Was it culture? Was it capabilities? Was it the way they were organized? How they invested their uh, scanning resources? But it really is a story of leadership. So let me frame it a little bit further. Um, and I'm going to start with, unfortunately, a very tragic aspect of the inability to detect and act on weak signals. And this is, of course, the 9-11 commission report on the tragic events that led to the 3,500 deaths. And they basically concluded, we failed to connect the dots. And this is a story that we have heard indeed uh, earlier today. Uh, but it, it reminds us that there is a lot of information out there. 
but it's the interpretation that matters, and that's what was lacking. Uh, here's some more contemporary examples. Why did uh, Microsoft miss the trend to bring your own device, which is transforming uh, the whole IT activity in most companies? Uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, Microsoft, by missing those weak signals, now has only less than 2% of the global smartphone platform market. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about the mortgage meltdown, uh, admittedly starting in the US. And uh, we should be properly uh, chastised for that and culpable. Uh, but the fact is, as in almost every instance of companies uh, missing weak savings, there were a few people who saw it sooner. And uh, I've just extracted a few headlines from the period 2005 to 2007. And uh, we see here Greenspan unconcerned about housing very late in 2006. Uh, yet there were people who were prescient. And uh, we see here uh, Warren Buffett, uh, John Paulson, Lawrence Fink, you perhaps can't read these, and uh, Cord Lloyd Blankfein uh, could see this more clearly, and they saw it sooner, and they acted on it. Uh, one might, uh, if, if you look at that pattern across those four people and their organizations, uh, they also had an incentive to see sooner, and that's a story we'll uh, pick up on later. So why are organizations so often surprised? As I say, we lived with a number of companies. We asked any number of senior officers in companies we respected as having a good track record on this. But ask, well, why are you surprised? Why were you surprised? And here's what we found consistently. Someone in your organization or network, and that's an important uh, addendum, knew all about a past surprise. But they didn't know that you needed to know, and you didn't know that they knew. So the, uh, the large organizations, which are largely rep represented here, almost invariably have weak signals coming in from across complex networks. Uh, these may be uh, weak signals of regulatory action, market changes, technology. And there's always someone in the organization that knows about it. What we concluded uh, from uh, extracting lessons from all this is that the problem is not a lack of data. And in fact, it's a surfeit of data, but it's a very poor quality data. What is lacking is good questions. And uh, I'll have much more to say about that tomorrow, but let me give you a flavor for what I mean by good questions. Medtronic uh, is a company that uh, you may know, makes pacemakers, uh, defibrillators. Uh, and it's an electrophysiological solution to irregular heartbeat, largely. About uh, six, five years ago now, they created a, uh, an internal task force, and they asked a simple question. What drug breakthroughs could either supplant or completely displace our devices? In other words, a drug that could have the same function in correcting irregular heartbeats? That I call a good question. And why was it a good question? Because it mobilized the organization to uh, focus on that, to collect what we call the paranoia from uh, the periphery, and they knew where to send it. Quite often, the reason that the weak signals are not communicated back to the people who can act on it is that there's no uh, clear channel of, of communication you don't know where to send it. Um, we then, as we were thinking about this and trying to learn more about it, uh, explored the literature on peripheral vision, and uh, that was really quite fascinating. I have many uh, lovely stories about that. But we did learn one thing that uh, I think is, is striking, and that is that the uh, human eye has about 90% of its cells, what are called uh, uh, cone cells. Uh, sorry, the cone cells are in the focal area. The rod cells are in the peripheral zone, and those rod cells make up about 95% of all the cells in the eye, and that's what allows us to detect 
uh, motion, see color differences, and so forth. Uh, I'm not advocating that ratio uh, or anywhere remotely close to that for organizations, but it surely had better be more than 5%. So this is the uh, jumping off point to our exploration of then uh, seeing why surprises are so often missed as to what the underlying reason was for some companies being significantly better than others. And uh, uh, we found it in the, uh, what we'll call the vigilant leaders, uh, like uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Jean Garnier. Uh, we uh, particularly drew insights from Andy Grove, who uh, wrote a wonderful book called Only the Paranoid Will Survive. Uh, and he noted that when spring comes, snow melts first at the edge, because that's where it's most exposed. So he was very attentive to it's weak signals coming in from the periphery of the organization uh, could be a sales manager in Taiwan or a technology partner uh, in an adjacent industry. They had tremendous channels for collecting that information. Uh, Jack Welsh uh, is renowned for uh, talking about a sixth sense, the ability to see around corners as absolutely crucial. So, based upon a number of interviews with CEOs of that ilk and uh, many others in what we consider to be outstanding companies, uh, we spent a lot of time, for example, with Steen Reisgard of uh, Novozymes, who really exemplified what we call a, uh, a, and led a vigilant leadership team with strategic foresight uh, and very externally oriented. From that, we uh, drew the distinction between what we'll call vigilant leaders and operational leaders. And uh, by the way, we're largely looking at this as a, an element of a team, as, as how the team is composed. And uh, diversity in teams is extremely important, of course, but the ratio of vigilant leaders to operational leaders within the C-suite team and the CEO and the chairman are what really matter. Uh, if there's too many operational leaders uh, the likelihood is that the company's going to get blindsided. So what we found about vigilant leaders, I think, is highly pertinent here. Uh, firstly, they consistently exhibited an outside-in approach. That is, they were able to stand in the shoes, not only of their customers, but also their competitors, and say, well, how would they look at us? Uh, they really networked widely. And uh, I found this an interesting attribute. We, but about 25% of the management teams we talked to networked only in what we would call familiar settings, industry trade meetings and so forth. They didn't venture out into other groups, uh, other industries. And, uh, and they, they failed, therefore, uh, one of the big tests is that how predictable was their thinking? Because if you only share insights with people of your own background, similar interests, who have followed the same path, you become pretty predictable. We found uh, that the vigilant leaders were much more uh, uh, able to see through the issues they were looking at, probe for second order effects. They embraced uncertainty, a theme we heard a good deal about this morning. And uh, they were willing to experiment a lot. I think this is an extremely important aspect of uh, being a vigilant management team, a leadership team, and a leader. Uh, and that is, uh, they, they experimented, they learned from them. Failure, um, in, 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 for example, in the 3M, they have the uh, marvelous term, well-intentioned failures. That is, we, uh, we, we did fail, and we recognized that, uh, but everybody was on board with the uh, initiative or the new product or the new venture, and uh, we accept collective responsibility, and we learn from it and progress. Contrast that with some organizations where a failure is really an, seen as an error and seen as the beginning of the search for someone to blame. And lastly, uh, vigilant leaders are enablers as opposed to controllers. So the operational leaders absolutely essential. 
They're the people who uh, are focused on the short run, deliver it, it improvements in efficiency, they extract value from their resources, but you need the right balance of operational leaders and vigilant leaders. So I think with that background, uh, I'm going to turn to a vigilant leader. And uh, he and I will therefore uh, uh, go back and forth on this topic. Uh, he'll fill in with his experience and then we'll be happy to open it up for questions. Shall I take over this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the second part of your presentation? You always have fallback slides. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Well, it doesn't react. Here we are. So what we just learned is very simple, and I make it very quick. Uh, risks and opportunities often begin as weak signals. The problem is not a lack of data. The problem is, um, where are the good questions? Third, peripheral vision is required and can actually be trained. And fourth, vigilant leaders help. So the question really to all of us in the business is, what stops us to react and read these signs? What stops us to you know, become visual, uh, uh, vigilant leaders? What stops leaders to be vigilant? You know, how do we implement this? So I thought I put together maybe six points that um, not stop us, but uh, hindering us to be fast and effective in implementing what we just heard from Professor Day. One is very obvious, the size of the organization matters. The size matters because the larger the organization, the further away the periphery is from the center and the top. So the longer it takes to report something from left to the center or from right to the center to the top. And of course, the problem is the moment it gets reported through hierarchies, it is dry cleaned. And by the end, it hits the CEO. It has been re-reported 20 times. So it's a completely washed and dry cleaned report. So that's dangerous, and that's a problem of big, large organizations. So what do you do? Build small profit centers, yes. Have reduced hierarchies, number of levels in your company, and avoid a matrix organization. By the way, I'm a fundamental believer that matrix organizations are not very good. Why? Because half of the organization is hiding, and you don't know which half. <laughs> Second point is, you have to make sure that you have a creative Corporate, corporate culture. Honestly, some people in the company always believe that everything you can control will avoid the risks and failure. So these are the control freaks, and there are lots of them in big corporations. So I think what you should do, instead of having um, freaks that are control freaks, you have to look at diversity, diversity from the top to the bottom. And we just had that. Diversity comes through different gender, it comes through different geography, age, uh, it comes through different color, of course, and we just heard it from Jennifer. Gender is very, very important, and it has to start on the top. Of course, you have to reduce comfort zones, and by adding diversity, you reduce comfort zones for your senior management team. You get them out of the routine. You have to make sure that your innovation teams are much bigger than your controlling department. And you have to establish what I call, and my father used to call, an enterprise of entrepreneurs. That doesn't mean that every one of your 10,000 people has to have his own business. It means that everyone has to have the wide eyes and act responsive as if he is an owner of the business, an owner of what he is doing every day. That's an entrepreneur, and you want everyone to react sensitive and responsive on each and every level. Third, let's be honest, in these days, sometimes we have an over-engineered corporate governance. Risk committees are responsible to address all the risks. I mean, all the big companies have ARC, Audit and Risk Committees. And sometimes they think, these guys do all the risk management and you know, we, they take care of it. And I show you real quick, before I come back, this is a risk matrix from us. I tell you, my guys believe everything is on this thing. The whole risk, everything is there. We just got to monitor it. 
and monitor it, and then nothing happens. No risk, no failure. So we have them here, that's it. It's all bullshit, we know this. We know it's, it's not all there, the fundamentals. I mean, look at what's in there. There is financing and liquidity risk. Great, huh? There is legal compliance, ethical business practices. Fantastic, huh? It's all rubbish, it doesn't help. So don't rely on your accounting department. Let me go one slide back. Controlling departments control and mitigate um, at, uh, all the risks, also bullshit. And we all know if you get your annual report in your hands and you think all the risk has been signed off by, January, uh, by December 31, rubbish. That's not the case. So don't delegate risk management to uh, lawyers, to auditors and statisticians. It doesn't help. You just close your eyes, that's what you do. Add operations people to risk, very important. So let me s skip this one here now. Fourth, we have very big head office, very often big head offices. Too much digestion of peripheral information through corporate reports. They get digested and digested, dry cleaned, as I said before. We have too many internal headquarter meetings because everybody has to show that they're busy. We have too little travel to operations in the periphery. And of course, with this, we also have too little listening to our customers. I tell you in our two businesses that have been mentioned, uh, one is ADECO. We have 120 people in the head office from a total of 33,000 people that work directly for us. At Barry Calabout, the chocolate company, we have 40 people in the head office out of 6,500 that work for us. What does it mean? It means that we have to travel to the outside of the periphery. We have to be there. We have to know our people outside. We have to know our customers. We have to talk to them. If you sit in your ivory tower, of course, you don't know what's going on in the periphery. Five and second last slide. Sometimes there's way too much work for the CEO. Let's be honest. If you are in a restructuring or if you have a problem left and right, what you do is you're stuck in operations. There's one solution which I really like, which is a bit different, let's say, to the American model, which is actually the Swiss corporate model where you have the president, sometimes the delegate of the board, who is in charge of the company in general and mainly the strategy and making sure that the strategy is implemented. And then he delegates the operational responsibility to the CEO. It's actually a quite a nice model as long as the chairman knows what he is doing and is not just a chairman that flies in once a month. That doesn't work because then you have a very uh, big danger for your strategy. But the model as such, if you make it work, it helps. And last point I want to make, and it's an obvious one, too much short-term pressure is a big danger. I have one thing that I always keep in mind. You know Walt Disney, when his first came, film came out, it was a huge success. He said to the guy who produced the film, you are only as good as your next film. Today in our companies, you are only as good as your next quarter. There is no CEO of a listed company that survives six consecutive quarters of under delivery. So everyone focuses on the quarter. What it means is no long-term vision. I could tell you a lot of cases where I as a chairman look at long-term. I don't want to bore you with it also with respect to the time, but we have to look at what's going on in the world in 2020. And I don't have a glass bowl for it. So what I do is I go outside, I talk to as many people as possible, and that's what you mentioned. Try to get your mind outside the company and think outside in. Thank you very much. Can I thank you both very much for that? I'm, just, I'm gonna throw it open to the floor. Just one quick question, and that is, when you talk of vigilant leaders, operational leaders, do you have any concept of what that balance would be? And would it be different for different sectors? Uh, so the, the balance is probably, arguably two thirds, one third of the C-suite, uh, perhaps led by a vigilant CEO. Uh, and uh, frankly, I have seen no difference in sectors. I think every sector that's represented in this room uh, is <coughs> facing a much more complex periphery, both technology, and, and we will include technology, regulatory changes, uh, customers, competitors, 
So the, the market environments are much more complex. I've even found fairly simple organizations that need more vigilance. Uh, just a, a quick story on a person who had a catering business, which, frankly, uh, very successful, very secure, quite domestic, and, and yet he was dependent almost for 60% of his sales from pharmaceutical companies. And these would be the, uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical reps detailing the drugs who would use food, meals, dinners, sandwiches, and so forth to uh, get curry favor with the doctor's offices. Very familiar selling process. But what happens when 50% of your customers no longer permit you to come in to see them? And he had no awareness of that. So I, I think what I find is that uh, it, it's, there's a high degree of variance within industries, and the leaders just systematically outperform the followers. Uh, Andreas, do you have any comment? Well, to, to be honest, I think uh, it has to be balanced, the vigilant versus the operational leader. By the end of the day, you need a lot of operational leaders to deliver the, the results. Um, I think the vigilant ones, of course, they're helpful on each and every different level, not just at the top, so mm -hmm. thinking that you need one CEO who's really a pain in the ass. No, it's not enough. He, you need a lot of uh, inspiring people, entrepreneurs on all levels. So that would be my statement, you know, try to be a company of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I, from my own experience, I would say that one factor which is a problem at present in banking is the inertia on regulatory reform. Dodd-Frank is a huge exercise in itself. If you're running a bank, the CEO of a bank, and you have vigilant leaders, you really don't know what's going to happen and what you're going to be allowed to do. So that seems to me to be something I would add in. Let me open it up, ladies and gentlemen, to yourselves. Maybe we can have the lights up. Thank you. Who would like to ask the first question? A lady here. And is there somebody else who wants to ask the second? Yes, another lady in the front. So maybe we can get a microphone there, and one uh, could be prepared to come here. Do stand up, say your name, and ask your question. Hello, thank you very much. I'm Lisa Herzog. I'm assistant professor in philosophy at this university, and I work on ethics in organizations. So I'm very interested in this topic. And one thing I was wondering about during your presentations um, is there is periphery within organizations, but there is also periphery in society at mm -hmm. large. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that among leaders in business, there is a certain cult of how many hours have you worked, how many hours, or how few hours have you slept. And it gives you a greater reputation, at least among young people of my age. It's, it just looks great when you say you work 80 hours, 100 hours. But that doesn't give you the time to actually meet other people, have other experiences, mm. actually reflect on what it could mean, and also have time for the unplanned events that might actually give you completely new insights. So how could this culture of being in the office 80 hours a week change? Wouldn't that be important for actually getting peripheral vision. Thank you very much. There's a... Uh, <coughs> Andres, I should have Andres first and yeah. then George. Okay. Well, it's a good observation and you're absolutely right. It is still very much a pattern that everybody is working a lot. But the question, of course, is it's not about working a lot. It's about, from time to time, stopping and, as you know, thinking rather than just working like a hell. So stopping and smelling the roses just to enjoy things and to get a different idea in your mind, and that's the key thing. So how do you train that? There is different ways to train that in, in organizations by taking them out, sending them from time to time to some, some outside location where they can meet and should meet with outside people, you know, push them to uh, meet uh, external idea takers, mm -hmm. uh, trend setters and whatsoever. So I think um, one way is, uh, is to really get them, take them by the hand from time to time and enforce them to do different things. But it's not so much about working a lot. To be honest, today working in global companies means working a lot because every, something around the globe always takes 24 hours. So uh, it's about quality time and less about just time, I'd say. George. There's an uh, absolutely fascinating dimension to your question. We looked at the periphery as that which was in the fuzzy zone outside the boundaries of the organization. 
And uh, that has, uh, in, in the best practice companies, led by vigilant leaders, they create a culture which is very much more open and accessible. They also put in capabilities in place. Your question also raised the question, well, what about events within the company? And uh, I, uh, I must say I can share this story because uh, we spent quite a bit of time in Japan, and one of the companies we interviewed was Olympus. And uh, that, of course, was, uh, if you're familiar with the scandal that emerged as they had buried all sorts of uh, financial malfeasance, and it was not reported to the, uh, the new CEO or to the board. Uh, and the same is true of uh, auditing <clears throat> problems. They may be buried and not brought to the attention of the leadership or the board. So I think the tone at the top really captures both parts of that, both the internal openness and the ability to be vigilant about what's happening in your periphery. And then, then it's, it's about seeing sooner in both cases. Thank you. Lady here in the front. Hello. My name is Elina Hiltunen, and I come from Finland. And I'm a futurist, so my task is to think about the future. And so I'm very interested about weak signals. And I'm fascinated about the idea of crowdsourcing weak signals in organization. So it wouldn't just be the leaders in the organizations that are looking for weak signals. Uh, and I would like to ask that, is there companies in the world that are crowdsourcing the weak signals in the organization? So even the uh, little lady uh, in the uh, telephone operator can tell that now the customer was really upset about our product. So this message would go to the leaders. Mm -hmm. So how much, it's, the issue is outsourcing. Uh, crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing. Uh, yes, crowdsourcing. So you could do that within the company as well. Yes. Yep. Yes, because I have been in an organization that was crowdsourcing the weak signals mm -hmm. all over the world. And I was just thinking that is this quite a unique organization or is this happening in many organizations? Professor Day, you have been doing this research, so I would like to ask your opinion about this. Uh, there are many, many very useful techniques, starting with scenario thinking and planning, uh, for identifying questions to ask. Then the question is, the, uh, what kind of mechanisms do you want to use? Which crowdsourcing is a, uh, that is internal crowdsourcing, I think you were referring to, yes. is a really valuable way to bring people into the conversation. Absolutely would endorse it. Uh, th that said, it's, uh, I think, we would also advocate, though, not rely on that solely, triangulate and confirm the weak signals. And we found that it's largely a matter of interpretation of a weak signal. So what, to, what exactly story can we draw from this? Mm. And having several sources of insight on that builds a richer story and also helps you implement the change much more quickly. You get buy-in, understanding, and then you can take the right kind of action. By the way, action may be no action at all other than to monitor it, to keep a watching brief. And you can go back and do uh, crowdsourcing or innovation tournaments uh, periodically to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lights up. Gentleman at the back there. I think a gentleman. And a lady here. Gentlemen at the back, can we, if not, can we get it? Maybe you can just shout, you know. So I, I really like the idea of an enterprise model with nerves, but I wonder as well about the risks of that, because wasn't that identified as one of, the, one of the causes of the Enron collapse? Too many entrepreneurs. Are there, are there risks? What, what are best practices around <laughs> getting everyone involved in the organization in an entrepreneurial sense without people pulling away like wild horses within an organization. Andreas, you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, I can't comment on the Enron collapse, but I tell you, um, if, if you live this enterprise of the entrepreneurs, um, this is a purely a cultural approach. Of course, it means that technically that there is probably less double signature processes, there's less metrics, 
So it means the organization is a lot faster, but it means that the organization allows to make mistakes. So it means, like uh, Professor Day said, there, you can, on a very small one-by-one -one basis, allow for experiments or for just, you know, entrepreneurial move forward without reporting every little single zip that you do. So, of course, you have to allow for certain mistakes, but you have to allow for mistakes to learn from mistakes, otherwise you learn from nothing. And uh, so, if you balance it, I think it's very, very healthy. By the end of the day, you care more about the individual, so you give the individual by giving them freedom, entrepreneurial freedom, you care a lot, and that is hugely motivating in the organization. So you don't sit there with demotivated, we have much more motivated people, and I think that alone pays out. George. I think that uh, in, 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 in deciding how much entrepreneurial latitude you want to have in this area of, really, we're trying to anticipate and sense things sooner, uh, one of the things we learned, which is slightly contrary to this notion of uh, let a thousand or ten thousand flowers bloom, is that there still has to be accountability. Uh, the simple uh, argument I make is, look, if I ask my three children to take the garbage out, I can guarantee you none of them. <laughs> They'll all look at each other and say, not my turn today. <laughs> and so accountability, knowing where the uh, insights uh, should be gathered and extracted, so that in the case of Medtronic, for example, uh, and I'll go back to that, is, a, is I think an example of creating a mechanism whereby everyone knew where to send their insights. Uh, Andy Grove had them come in directly, but that's pretty hard to manage. Uh, so uh, task forces, crow's nests, uh, scenario teams, all different mechanisms for helping gather the, uh, the weak signals and, and interpret them. So you need both, but uh, clear accountability somewhere along the way is, is extremely important. If I may add one sentence, if I mean enterprise of entrepreneurs, I don't say that they should be responsible for the top line only. It means accountability, i.e. as much as you can, responsibility for the bottom line as well, for the bottom line of that little job that everyone is doing. So that means accountability. So an entrepreneur is eventually accountable for the entire P&L. Lady there. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Tika and I'm from Indonesia. I recently read an article about the flip side of meritocracy system. It's creating an elite who is unable to connect with the ordinary citizen. If you just take an example of the CDO, I mean, it's very rational the moment you ease the requirement of people to subscribe for a mortgage the higher the demand, and the demand will drive the price. But then as more and more people are taking the mortgage, there will be like some point when they just give up to service their debt, and they're just going to just don't pay it, and the whole system is not going to be sustainable. So I just want to ask you a question, that the reasons why the leaders are unable to react to the weak signal and comment on the fact that there is less diversity, and the fact that most of the leaders are educated in a similar way. They are now in the top schools. And the fact that they are unable to connect with the ordinary citizen, they don't really know who are the people in the main street, mm -hmm. the people who don't have street. So to put it in a very blunt way, how you understand the periphery, the periphery if you've never been in the periphery. Thank you so much. Has, has never been, I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part? How you understand what's going on in the periphery if you've oh, never yeah. been in, in the, the periphery. periphery. Oh, if you've yeah. never been there yourself. Yeah. Uh, George. The, uh, the, 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 the vigilant leaders, and, 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 and I, I want to go back to this notion of getting out there yourself and visiting the outlying territories. Andreas gave some wonderful examples, I think, of how you do that. So the answer is a, uh, a, a really effective vigilant leader is one who is out there anyway and is making those connections, probably spent time in the periphery. Uh, the other thing they can do, though, which is, I find quite fascinating, is they encourage mavericks. Now, a maverick is someone who has gotten crosswise with the organization more than a few times, uh, thinks differently, challenges authority, and is quite often, in some organizations, likely to be ejected like a uh, virulent microbe that doesn't fit the organism. 
Uh, but those people are to be prized and uh, encouraged to bring forth their ideas. Now, they can't be uh, totally off the wall, but a maverick who's had a track record of being correct in the past is willing to challenge assumptions, actually is someone to be prized. Maybe a little add-on from, from the, the business side. I mean, today we all know most business become more and more global. I think the times are over that you can run a global business with Western and Westerly ed educated people. I mean, that is over. If you run a business in, in Asia, you have to have someone from, from Asia to yeah. do it, to understand. And so these people very often understand and have been out in the periphery because the periphery in India or in Indonesia is completely different to the periphery in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So now, when I said earlier, now that we all understand we need diversity, we need to understand that with the global business, most companies understood to, to recruit and to have representatives of di different uh, countries, different you know, background and background in education overall, um, have to be the representatives of the company. That is definitely changing. I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that we've really, we're over time, and I'm afraid I have to draw uh, this session to a close. But can I ask you to thank these two gentlemen for their contribution? Thank you.